to give you some additional information uh, like for the project and in general for the course. Uh, so how do you deal with memory bugs? Well, uh, use a GDB, for example, right? GDB helps you uh, to find bad pointer dereferences. Uh, but, you know, in general, it's maybe harder to detect other memory bugs. For example, if you're running some, uh, your, you know, malloc for a while, it already corrupted your heap. And, you know, it, when it crashes, it may be just too late already. So there's just a lot of damage has been made. So if it's just point, now pointed reference or some just invalid pointer, that's easy, but not otherwise. Um, also, what else you can have, right? So you can have data structure consistency checker. Uh, again, that can work, but probably, uh, you know, uh, may, may help you a little bit, right? Also, wall grind. I'm not sure where you're going to use wall grind for uh, project one, but maybe later for project three, you will use it. Um, but again, you can use it for project one as well, right? So you can also have bad detect, bad point. Well, actually, use it if possible, right? So if you want to, uh, you, if you uh, wall grind should help for project one, I think, as well, right? So you could, if you have all bad pointers or like overrides, so that can help you. In general, though, I actually should say that uh, for project one at the very least, use the debugger, but use it wisely so that in case if you are really stuck, maybe maybe it's a good time to re revisit your code, to look at your code one more time, to, to more, look at, at it more critically, to kind of question every line and uh, say, okay, is it really true that this line is doing this stuff, right? Let me check that. So maybe look at this uh, more carefully, right? Before going to really deep in the debugging, because sometimes you may be debugging this issue, but this uh, the issue that you are debugging is already some symptom, not the problem, right? So, so it's kind of already some symptom of other issue. So therefore, uh, combine like this debugging tools such as GDB, wall grind, uh, with you know you know, just general code review or maybe use some printf statements. Again, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't use GDB. You actually have to use GDB, right? So I think that will help you a lot, uh, especially if you have just bad pointer dereferences that can really help you with this uh, free list, like when you have to debug this linked list that you have to maintain. Uh, but uh, it also means that... Um, don't be stuck if you like try to do something else if you are, if you cannot make immediate progress with gdb all right so try something else uh try to change some code try to comment out some code try try different strategies right maybe disable one block perhaps coalescing is not that critical for correctness uh purposes it's important for performance purposes so you can probably comment out coalescing and check whether your work code is running without Kalesin and, and, and so on. And then come back to Kalesin, then you know for sure there is some bug there. So that helps you to do search in your code and eliminate all different possibilities. So I guess not for this project, but in general, one thing that uh, can be useful, like uh, libc, malloc as some checking code, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can also enable that heap checker there. Um, because uh, again, here is the opposite. You implement your own malloc, so you cannot. Uh, so you have to implement your own heap checker. Uh, but you know, in general, that can be useful. So you know, just to remind that project one is available already for some time, right? So it's uh, please implement uh, your own malloc and uh, uh, you know your your own memory allocator. There will be multiple deadlines. To, as you already saw that checkpoint deadline that is coming up. Uh, then uh, then we have final submission deadline that will become will come later. And final, there will be TA sessions. So for the for the checkpoint, uh, you can implement a simple memory allocator. You can probably go with an implicit list also, right? Uh, though I would encourage you to try an explicit list if your time allows, right? So that way you don't need to waste time later, right? So if you can implement an explicit list, 
later for the final submission you can uh, extend it to segregated list um, and then get a good performance for the final submission right um, on, on the other hand if you are close to the deadline maybe it's better to implement whatever works right so and just to to get this checkpoint deadline uh, because you don't want to lose points for for the, your checkpoint um for the final submission it will be very important to have an allocator that has both good throughput as well as memory utilization so hopefully after the checkpoint you have some experience you already have written some simple memory allocator whether it's an implicit list allocator or explicit list allocator um you know so you can for example uh implement explicit list but then you still see that all your work didn't kind of pay off yet right so like uh uh like was really a kind of spent a lot of efforts implement doubling list but then still your performance is not that great but th that's actually uh not a big deal because you can uh, you know extend your explicit list version to segregated list because segregated list is effectively just a bunch of explicit lists and the explicit list version will give you, I think, a significant performance boost, right? So, but again, the way that you're going to structure, maybe you're going to do checkpoint one implementation and completely redo it for the final version. That's also pos possible, right? So it's up to you how you want to do that. You know, and then there'll be TA sessions. Uh, we will ask questions. So for example, if you are unable to explain the code, uh, that, uh, I mean, that might be questions to uh, both te uh, team members or maybe just to this specific team member. Uh, and if this team member is unable to explain the code that this team uh, uh, member has written, right, and we may have some suspicion that we can go explore further, right, and then maybe it will realize that this person was cheating, right? Uh, so that that can be also the case. Uh, so we have this TA session. So you, when you have to go through this, uh, answer some uh, questions about the code. So please don't cheat uh, because it creates a lot of hassle for, for us, right? And as well as, uh, you know, there's going to be a severe penalty for that. So don't share code or with other groups. Uh, don't, like, I mean, you can find something online. And then, okay, you will have a temptation to use that, but don't do that, right? So, I mean, there is probably plenty of implementation of Malik online, uh, you know, and probably most of, most of them are not that great, but, you know, it doesn't even matter whether they are great or not. You, you shouldn't use them. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you found, maybe perhaps you found some code, not for the memory allocator, but maybe for a tree, uh, and uh, you're saying, okay, that's not really an allocated, just a tree implementation. Can I use that tree implementation? Well, that we can discuss, right? So then you can contact us and we can discuss it. Um, but, you know, in, in any case, if in doubt, please ask, right? So please ask first. Uh, you don't want to use anyone else uh, solution, right? So that's the bottom line here. And... Uh, even if you use some, even if you do allow you to use some code like trees, uh, then we still have to get some permission first. Um, but again, I'm not sure, by the way, I'm not necessarily encouraging you to do trees implementation. You can do that uh, if you want, uh, but just to kind of give you uh, like an idea, when I was implementing my own uh, malloc, uh, I implemented it of segregated list uh this power of two right classes and then i also did an additional optimization well that didn't give me 100 percent points right so that was still like 90 or something uh then i did uh uh did an additional optimization for the uh footer so it uh, but we, i'm not going to talk about this yet i guess i will talk that closer to the final deadline once you are done with segregated list. So it will be really premature to talk about this about this right now. Uh, it's something that you can integrate later, right? So just now we just focus on header and footer, but later there is a way to eliminate footer in allocated blocks, not in free blocks, but in allocated blocks. Uh, it's a little tricky. This is why I'm not saying that do it right now, right? So it will be a complete mess in your code, right? So premature optimization, the root of all evil, right? So there's a, a there is this uh, 
uh, old thing, right? So don't uh, don't uh, rush to do every single optimization in your code right now. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. So I once I implemented that, I got hundred percent points, right? So that just to give you an idea what kind of approach you can implement. Again, I'm not saying you have to implement segregated list. I'm not saying you have to uh, implement something else, you know, just at least I know that segregated list should give you 100% points if you implement all optimizations. Um, you can also use three and maybe you can get away there, there without some additional optimization. I don't know, right? So, but uh, it, it's something that you can explore if you have time. Um, okay, so, uh, if in doubt, always ask us, uh, right? So don't use any code that you found online. And don't even look at this because, you know, looking at this code is also a potential problem, right? Because it's hard to forget <laughs> once you saw something, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyway, yeah, so... Uh, so what are your best friends uh, for the project, right? So in general, like have developed some good habits, code a bit every day, test out a few, after a few lines of new code. Don't push it till the very last moment because if you push it till the very last moment, even though the textbook has some implicit list allocator implementation and perhaps, uh, you can use it as inspiration, uh, but you know, so it still requires some changes, right? But I'm pretty sure if you put it till the very last moment, even with the, you won't be able to implement even the textbook version because again, that requires some changes there, right? So that, so, but you probably want to do better than the textbook, uh, and I would actually encourage you to do better than the textbook. So yeah, so test every few uh, every few lines, maybe not every line, but make sure you recompile your stuff once in a while and test if it still runs. Um, you know, also you have to do incremental uh, upgrades, right? So whenever you push your commits to Git, make sure that, I mean, we don't want to have just one large commit at the very end when you just put your entire memory allocator because we don't know where the code came from, right? Why? Why is it coming in the last moment like this, right? So we should see the entire history and the entire history of like every partner, right? It's totally fine. Don't be embarrassed if you did some silly stuff, right? In the Git history, there is no, not a big deal. We are not going to judge you on that, right? So, uh, but what will be a problem if you have something that like uh, just a large commit and, you know, and nothing else, right? How can we... How can we be sure that you wrote this code? We don't even see the uh, like the like the incremental progress. Also, that will help us to resolve any conflicts. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, I mean, even if you uh, agree to work with this partner yourself, right, and you initially were fine. Sometimes later on, from my experience, what happens like. Uh, you know, some people say, okay, this partner didn't do too much. You know, I did everything on my own. And sometimes it's true. Uh, we look at the Git uh, history and that is confirmed. And then we take some action, right? But sometimes it may be not fully true. It will be a little bit exaggerated, right? So Git history helps you in both cases, right? Uh, so uh, that kind of confirms that we... Uh, your partner did something or right or your partner didn't do some you know anything we can really see that by the way regarding this we finalized all these uh, groups i had uh, quite a few requests like please reassign me to a different team i was i want to work with a different teammate you know by this time i assume we are done uh so because we really have to work on the project already so if there is any further issues and they sometimes arise, not frequently, but sometimes they arise. Your partner is not responding or just your partner dropped the course. All kinds of issues can happen. Uh, even if, again, even if you are, wanted to work with this teammate, uh, these things can happen. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a random partner. It can be even the partner that you wanted to work with. Uh, so that, that issues will happen. At that point, our strategy is that uh, certainly the partner that was not responding, not contributing will work alone at least for till the end of the project one from that point, right? 
uh, and uh, so that that's for sure, right? Uh, for the other partner, we may or may not accommodate, uh, but remember the projects are comp completely doable uh, if they're by single person, right? So there is no, so we're given this flexibility to do it in groups, but it's not absolutely required. So in case if there is any conflict, disagreement or whatever, right? So we just split the group and you work alone from that point on. Um, yeah, so that's how we're going to deal with these issues. Um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, I think that's the. I think from my past experience that uh, the best strategy because uh, you know. So just if you have some problems, let us know. We will split your group, and that's it. Uh, of course, uh, that can be probably revised for project two. Though there is no hundred percent guarantee that you can find a partner, but I'm pretty sure if there is several cases like this, maybe you can find some partner, right? Who ended up in this situation, right? So. Um, uh, so that's like maybe uh, in one team, some person dropped the course and the other team, some person dropped the course, but these people who left without a partner can form a new team for project two. Uh, yeah, so at least that's uh, that's the strategy that we can use. In general, of course, working in teams uh, should be useful uh, for you because it may have this burden that you have to coordinate your efforts with another person, but uh, it also kind of prepares you for your software engineering work. So where you have to collaborate with people and that's, I think, important. And all these issues that you will see, some partner is not responding, someone is not doing too much, that will happen in real life, right? So that's not happening, I mean, just in uh, this course, when you go to work, that's the same thing that will, will happen there, maybe in different form, but still. Uh, yeah, so that really is a good, uh, will be a good preparation also, right? But hopefully everything more or less will be fine. Uh, and, you know, so hopefully you will enjoy working teams. Um, remember that both students have to contribute equally. We can go back to the history and review that, right? So it's not like give you an example. Uh, like if one person is implementing a less and another person is implementing link list, Perhaps that's fine. But if one person is just implementing everything and the other person is just putting some comments at the very end of this, uh, like that's not good, right? And maybe changes some style of the code a little bit. Uh, you know, that you understand that it's a negligible contribution, right? Uh, so we have to make sure that, uh, I mean, it's up to you. We are not going to micromanage your teams and say you have to implement this or that. Uh, it's up to you to split the workload. But uh, again, make sure it's uh, fair right to every partner right um okay uh so let's look next right so okay um so also use office hours right so please come to office hours we have tas uh so we also have four LAs. Um, one LA is actually here right now, right? So, uh, so we will. Uh, uh, they will probably also help with the project, right? Especially when as we approach the deadlines, and especially maybe for the final deadline, uh, but maybe even for the checkpoint as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So please make sure to use these uh, opportunities. So also in general for the course and maybe for this particular project, learn how to use the man pages uh, like manuals uh, in Linux type man and the command. So this way you can read some documentation. Uh, also go over the tutorials. We have GDB tutorial. I'll see if I can, uh, if I have something for Git and Linux, but I, I hope that most of you are familiar with Git and Linux, right? With that, shouldn't have any issues. Because by this time you already uh, had this uh, programming assignment set up, right? So that was a small exercise in the beginning, and you know you're probably already using Linux, so at least in the lab machine. So hopefully that should be fine. Um, so make extensive use of the information on the web, but don't copy any solutions. So again, you cannot just go and copy Malik implementation, whether this for this project or some similar project or just 
unrelated to this project, but somebody implemented memory allocator uh, or something along the same lines, right? Uh, but on the other hand, let's say you are not sure how to use function pointers, you are not sure how to do typecasting in C, it's totally fine to look up on the internet and see some stack overflow question which asks the same thing, right? And, uh, or like, you know, you don't, for example, you want to implement a tree, but you don't know how to implement AVL tree or balance tree. Okay, then at that point, you can go to this gig for gigs website and check what, uh, uh, what you or what useful information you can find there uh, with respect to that particular problem, not not to the assignment, right? But uh, like how to implement trees, right? So that's not related directly to the to the project. Um, so again, not solutions, but some questions can easily be resolved by looking online. And we don't prohibit that, right? So, but again, not solutions. Don't copy any code. Don't look at any code that's directly related to, uh, to the project. Or even indirectly, but as long as it's uh, on the same lines, right? That we gonna be a problem. Okay, so let me uh, talk a little bit uh, how we. Uh, uh like some some additional information for project one and you know one thing that you can use your textbook uh the computer systems a programmer's perspective what i call cs app textbook uh you you can use that one it's uh, in the list of recommended textbooks um yeah, so uh, yeah, i don't think there is any online at least uh, there's no probably any legal online <laughs> copy <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, but if you don't need that uh, textbook. Uh, uh, you just need. Uh, uh, I mean, we have all this information covered. But in case if you have that one, you can use it. And I'm gonna just take some like present some more material which I found useful. The textbook has an implementation, uh, but the implementation is actually. Uh, not something that you can directly use. First of all, again, that would be a problem is uh, academic integrity if you just copy and paste uh, textbook version, right? But the other thing is that the textbook version is designed for 32-bit processor and we have a 64-bit processor. So we use eight byte words, we use double word is 16 byte, but the textbook has four byte words and, six, uh, and eight byte double word, right? So that's totally different there. So you have to adjust those things. You also the textbook probably uses int. We have to use size t, uh, and uh, you know the textbook uses macros. We have to use probably inline functions or constants instead because we disallow macros. Uh, so certainly you cannot use it directly anyway. And the other thing is that I don't particularly like the textbook code because uh, I mean it's probably. You can do it. You can write it a little better and in a simpler way, right? So again, maybe uh, not looking at the score is better, right? But if you really want to look at this, take a look. Uh, so uh, yeah, so just some information from the uh, also textbook. Just you know, just to remind how we kind of uh, uh, like how we uh, show these pictures, right? So we I have allocated block shaded, right? Three blocks unshaded, like the white ones, right? So, and then uh, headers are labeled with size. So we already used that style in the present, uh, previously in our uh, previous lectures, just to remind you. So, again, just don't use directly because uh, the, also keep in mind the textbook version I will not give you too many points for the final uh, for the final uh, version, right? So you have to implement something better in terms of it is memorization and throughput. And this is where it can be a little bit temptating to look at the textbook code uh, to kind of use all the complicated functions, you know, all the stuff. But at the same time, uh, you know, maybe it's not the best strategy. Maybe it's something that you can design better if you don't look at it. Um, yeah, so again, it's up to you. Um, I'm not going to present any code here, right? But if you have the textbook, you can take a look. But don't copy and paste any code. 
So uh, just one information that I think is useful from the textbook. Um, you can see uh, this in this diagram, how this hip is organized, right? So you have the start of the hip um, and then uh, the first block, the very first word, sorry, not the first block, but the very first word is unused. So why do we need this unused word, by the way? Any ideas? Why do we need this extra pattern? Just forget about prologue block. You can even just pretend that it doesn't exist. So why do we need this extra pattern in the beginning? So recall that the requirement is that the payload of the allocated block is double word aligned. So initially the hip is double word aligned. I mean, it's actually more than double word aligned, but at least double word aligned. Uh, so if you put header, your payload is no longer going to be double word aligned. It's going to be just word aligned. Right? If you put header, that's going to be eight bytes. Initially, the address was 16 byte aligned. You put eight bytes in front, that's no longer uh, properly aligned. So now your payload is only eight byte aligned. So you have to put extra eight byte uh, so to make it 16 byte aligned. So now the trick that is they're doing here, they say, let's put this eight bytes in front before the header. So that way header is initially misaligned. So it's no longer double word aligned. But after the header, you have double word aligned again, right? Uh, so so th this is why they put this pattern in front, then use blow, then use the word, right? Um, and then put the header. So that combined together gives you 16 bytes. So this is how the payload becomes uh, again double word aligned. So now after the payload, you have footer. So let's say payload is also double word uh, aligned. So you align the size to, to round it up to the double word size. Um, you have a footer. So the footer starts at double word aligned address. Uh, you can even see it here on this picture. The footer is still double word aligned. Um, but then you have a header following header, right? So again, so after footer, you again become misaligned, right? Then you put header, you're again double word aligned. So you only need to insert this unused padding to the front of the heap. So once you start using footers and headers, uh, that's, that will become, uh, again, that, uh, that alignment will be preserved. As long as you make sure that the payload area is also double word aligned. So the payload, you have to round up uh, the size. So let's say if your size is zero, then it stays zero, right, uh, the payload. Uh, if the size of uh, payload is eight, you probably have to round it up to 16. Uh, if the payload size is like 15, it also has to be round, rounded up to 16, right? Uh, if the payload size is 24, you have to round it up to 32. Right, so just make sure it's you round it up uh, to double work. So it's, it will be multiple of 16. Um, so whatever size the user requests uh, is not necessarily the one that you will actually allocate. You can allocate a little bit more and that's totally fine, right? So you will round it up to the double word. Um, yeah, so once you put Fura in the end, it's misaligned header. Uh, starts at the misaligned address, after header, again, double word aligned. So again, the next payload is uh, properly aligned. And then you can just recursively continue, right, this argument, right? So you will have all payloads double, uh, which will be double word aligned. So this is how you can do that without wasting memory, right? Because you don't want to just insert padding uh, and wasting that memory. You want to do it smarter, right? So you just, wasting one word is okay. Wasting uh, like padding in every single block, that would be uh, bad, right? 
So you don't want to, because eight bytes is not a small amount. If you like look, I mean, it's maybe a small amount if you allocate it once, but if you allocate a lot of 20 bytes war or 20 byte blocks, eight bytes can become a significant overhead. So we already have this overhead due to header and footer. So we don't want to have anything extra on top of that. Um, so also you can see there is prologue block and epilogue block. Let's talk about the prologue and epilogue block. So why do you need the special blocks? Any ideas? Any guesses? So why is it marked as allocated? Both prologue and uh, epilogue are marked as allocated. They are always marked as allocated. Any guesses? You want to try? Coalescing, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So this is also kind of, yeah. So this is something that, like, you want to consider this corner cases, right? For coalescing. Remember, coalescing has in during coalescing, you have to look at the left side and the right side. You have to compare whether to, to make sure if they're, if they're free, you can comp uh, merge together, right? So now you kind of create a fake header uh, if we are talking about epilogue. Uh, which says, okay, I'm occupied, you know. So that way, whenever someone tries to call less uh, and they will be at the very end, they will know that they cannot call less uh, at that point uh, with, the, with the right side. So you don't need to handle that case uh, specially, right? So you just place that Apple lock and uh, your procedure stays the same, right? So it just uh, will determine that it's an allocated block and cannot uh, call us with it. The same is for prolog. So it's going to look uh, uh, the predecessor and the predecessor predecessor footer. And the footer uh, says that it's allocated. So therefore, I cannot call less with my left side. Um, so that way, the, if it's the very first block, it cannot, uh, it will not attempt to call less with the left side. So if the block is in the middle, it will try to call less with both left and right side. But this is how you handle these two cases as well. And by the way, you will, can have a case when you have just one block and it's uh, surrounded by prologue and epilogue that will also be covered. So that, that way you will see that you cannot call this. So all these corner cases will be covered if you have prologue and epilogue. So effect, effectively the purpose of epilogue is to provide a fake header for the block uh, so that to kind of say that's allocated so, you can, so that you don't call this with it. Um, and the purpose of prologue is to provide a fake footer uh, for the other side, right? So um, now uh, it's possible to also put this, uh, you know, so the textbook has this separate unused space and uh, prologue space. So the, if in case of prologue, you put uh, header and footer but you, uh, the payload is basically empty, right? So in the case of textbook, they, their word size is four, therefore the prologue block is eight bytes. I mean, in your case, it's gonna be 16 bytes. Um, so you can do that. Uh, you can also just combine uh, prologue with this unused space in front. Uh, you can kind of treat it as some sort of fake footer uh, and just mark it as used. Uh, like uh, as allocated uh, as allocated footer, right? And then maybe also size zero, just like uh, we did it for epilogue. So the reason probably, the, the reason why the tech book is not doing it, uh, I mean, even though it's kind of obvious, why do we need to kind of waste extra two words if you can just use that one? Uh, so the reason why the textbook is probably doing it because they wanted to be on a safe side because for the footer, Sometimes the way that you can implement, you immediately can jump to the header and look at the header, but there is no header here. Uh, if you just use, uh, if you don't use prologue block and just uh, use this fake foot in front. Um, so as long as you are sure that you, what, you, you, what you are doing, let's say if you are looking at the footer, just one second, if you are looking at the footer and see that it's allocated, then I'm not gonna try to call less with that. Uh, so then it's still gonna be fine. 
So, but the textbook is doing it for safety reasons. So that in case if you're still trying to access the header after this, your program will not crash. So, but otherwise you can combine the purpose of the unused book uh, as the unused word and the prolong block. Why don't you need a footer for the epilogue? For the epilogue, there's no footer, right? So you only need header. Well, I mean, because typically, yeah, so that you can put footer as well, right? So, but again, there is no point in doing it. I guess the reason why they don't do that uh, is because you typically don't access footer if you already found that in the header that uh, this block is allocated. But the other reason you can see that footer with the epilogue block together kind of gives you double word aligned, right? So maybe they don't want to uh, kind of, when they, whenever they expand the heap, they probably want to expand it by double word, right? Um, size memory. Uh, so, so they don't want to waste an extra word after this. But again, I said, as I said, you can even exclude the prologue block. So you can just have fake footer in front and fake header at the end, right? Um, so it's up to you, right? Just be sure that you know you know what you're doing. If you just fake footer, make sure you never access the header if uh, for that fake footer. The same is for fake header, make sure you don't access footer for that. So also keep in mind that certain things like, like of course, prologue and epilogue and uh, they are initialized during, or like when you initialize your heap uh, and prologue is gonna stay the same as well as unused word, uh, but the epilogue will move. Once you expand the heap, you will move the epilogue. So make sure you understand what's, what's going on here, right? So once you expand by certain size, you have to move it to the very end. So, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, again, padding is very important. You have to uh, you have to make sure you have it, right? So, uh, because otherwise we will be, uh, we will violate double, double word alignment. So whether you use prolog or not, that's a different question, but you certainly have to have this one word in front before the header. So the way that I treat it, if it's one word in front, it's sort of fake footer. And remember that footer starts at double word aligned uh, address always, right? And header starts at misaligned address, but the footer starts at double word aligned address. So that's another way to think about this problem. Any questions so far? Just be sure that you are careful, right? So when you program, Make sure you cal correctly calculate sizes because it's very easy to make a mistake to forget that you also have a head and footer when you allocate memory. Uh, or like whenever you expand the heap, you need to know by how much you're actually gonna expand. Uh, yeah, so just make sure you, you understand what's going on there. Okay. So by expanding, do you just mean like every time like you would run malice? Well, you will run out of memory, right? At some point, uh, maybe you allocated all blocks are allocated. All all blocks that you have don't uh, cannot accommodate uh, your request, right? So they are all small, right? At that point, you have to expand the heap to allocate extra memory. So that for that case, you will use mem as brk. Again, what kind of strategies you're going to use to expand the heap? It's up to you. Uh, I think our MEMS BRK is not super expensive and probably it's not a big deal for a checkpoint anyway, but for the final version, maybe it will make some difference. Uh, so at that point you can experiment with that. Um, so whether you want to expand by the same size that you just need to allocate or whether you want to actually expand by a larger size, yeah, so that you can experiment with that later. Maybe you want to expand by at least page size or something like that. So we have a function to get a page size uh, as an example. It typically makes sense. I mean, let me put it this way. Maybe in the, I, I don't know if it's going to affect your score too much, uh, whether you use what, depending on what kind of exp, uh, expanding, because our uh, MEMAS BRK is pretty cheap, I think. But uh, in real life, of course, SBRK is not cheap because it requires a system call. 
So when you do a system call, you would at least probably want to have maybe expand by page size, right? So uh, at least you would uh, have four kilobyte uh, expansion if you even if you just want to allocate 20 bytes so that you're not going to do uh, another SBR key right after this. Okay, go ahead. Any specific size what hip? For me, initialize on heap. Well, again, you can start. Uh, again, again, I don't think it matters too much for the checkpoint, but you certainly can start with like, uh, you certainly need to fit uh, the unused word. Uh, you certainly need to, if you use prolog block, you have to fit the prolog block. Uh, then you have to use epilog blo uh, block, right? Uh, so certainly these things have to be there. Maybe you it's just you start with this and then once you have the first allocation request you will expand or maybe you just initialize with page size uh, uh, initially and just put a free block in the remaining space uh, like already some some extra space so that your first request will not fail right so it will uh, you will hopefully be able to allocate without calling SBRK. So it's up to you, but either way, you at least have to feed this stuff, right? As I said, probably allocating page size is a good idea uh, in general, not necessarily for the project, for this particular project, because our MMS PR key is relatively cheap. I think, at least I looked at this, I don't think it will impact performance too much. Well, the problem is when, you, so if you expand by four kilobytes, that's probably a good strategy. The only thing that you have to be careful to not make any mistake, to kind of keep track what the size is and, you know, like, so that you know what you're doing, right? Uh, so that uh, make sure you uh, like uh, don't le lose any memory, right? When you expand, like you uh, like put it as a free block correctly and so on. As I said, maybe if you, for checkpoint, this is a less of a concern, even if you just put unused work prologue and epilogue as a starting point, and do MEMAS BRK by the size that was requested to uh, to kind of uh, to attach something extra to the heap later, right? That's still going to be work fine. For final version, you can experiment with different uh, things, right? And see how performance changes. Okay. Um, just do whatever is easier, right? Because uh, at the, for the checkpoint. Don't do too much. Again, this is some, some an example of optimization. Do I want to allocate four kilobyte or do I want to allocate the size that I need to, to, to have right now? Uh, well, it's again, it's an optimization. And optimizing too much in your initial version may be uh, kind of not a good idea because you can easily make a bug there and then, uh, you know, maybe it has some benefits, but you will spend a lot of time debugging it. So it's better to uh, introduce these changes incrementally. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, please get started. Yeah, so please get started. Don't put it off till the very last moment. So let's talk uh, uh, also the second topic is global impact of the US. And as I said, on the canvas will have a quiz for uh, for this uh, part of the lecture. So make sure you, uh, but you will have sufficient time and you know, you can review lecture slides. Uh, um, yeah, so that's fine. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about what global impact of operating systems. So, uh, so what is the uh, one one thing that uh, operating systems um, affects? Like, like one thing is that uh, certainly you can argue that OS affected open source significantly, right? So, for example, consider large scale projects such as GNU, right, so which was founded by Richard Stallman. That kind of uh, like the, the the original goal was to develop the operating system and tools. Right, so like uh, with open source, and uh, so that people can uh, change the uh, the tools and you know recompile without any restrictions. Uh, and back then there was a lot of proprietary tools, and that was a big deal. Um, 
and uh you know so that was that kind of uh like really spawned the interest in this uh entire open source field right so there is really i think it was i mean you it probably will not be an overestimation to say that GNU affected a lot of things right and you know linux is another example of a large scale project uh like Lina, uh was linux was initially developed by linus torvalds and later on a lot of other developers joined and you know it became a very large open source project that we have nowadays so also uh you know more recent examples like git uh that was also developed uh, by linus torvalds initially i kind of, kind of started as a uh, by him right uh because i guess part of the experience was like working uh with this large project and dealing with these different uh teams like and you know com different commits and you know different uh, uh branches of the code right so definitely there was no good tool back then and you know they decided to develop their own tool which can do a lot of good things and nowadays git is used a lot right so this is how the os development uh actually impacted the open source projects and you know many other open source projects were inspired by GNU on linux so by the way when i say GNU and linux you can you probably have heard that some linux distributions still use that like debian GNU slash linux so they kind of say that it's combination of GNU and linux because the original goal of GNU was to develop an operating system but back but at the same time linux uh also appeared so they kind of combined those efforts right so to say and you know so and then uh we have this kind of combination of gonna want linux nowadays um yeah so also consider some proprietary products uh that changed our life right so like android phones use linux kernel yeah certainly the user space environment can be different but it still runs the linux kernel fundamentally right but even if you don't use Android, you use like uh, Apple products, right? So you use OS X or iOS, whatever, right? So that uh, that comes from Darwin, right? Open source project. And Darwin contains a BSD code. Uh, so that's another example, you, you know, so that even though it's not Linux, but some other uh, BSD is another example of an uh, open source operating system. Um, also consider things like Chrome, right? Or like Microsoft Edge or Apple Safari, like similar browsers, right? Maybe almost all browsers that we have except, uh, you know, Firefox. Uh, so all of them like, uh, like either based on Blink or, or WebKit and Blink itself is based on the WebKit. And WebKit was based on KHTML. And KHTML, it was a, a, originally a browser that was kind of developed for Linux that was in uh kitty uh environment right so it was a not a well it was a good browser but it was not that complicated right so and nowadays it came uh, like we really have this large scale project such as blink or webkit and a lot of you know proprietary browsers even using it right so pretty much you know as i said except firefox everyone switched to that so again, this is another example how people uh, just, you know, started as an OS development, some OS related development, how it affected other things. Uh, also, you know, software engineering, consider how that changed the software engineering. Uh, like the open source model is not really used just by enthusiasts anymore, right? So initial maybe it was used by some open source enthusiasts, but you can see that a lot of commercial companies like Google, Microsoft, Apple, AMD, Intel, IBM, they already kind of, you know, embraced open source to one to one way or the other, right? So they have their own open source product, they have their own contributions. Uh, yeah, so that, that really has changed a lot of things. Uh, also consider like academic research, right? In academic research, if you look at some papers, so POSDI papers, and systems, they use Linux a lot, right? So or they either use Linux as a baseline to compare against, right? Or they may be uh, extending Linux or they may be developing some other OS, but still comparing to Linux and some uh, or, or some others open source OS, right? 
So this is really a, also affects uh, research, but not just in systems. Uh, let's say if you go to, to, um, to distributed computer, maybe there's people already also using Linux as well, right? Or maybe you're going to, machine, going to go to machine learning field. People are also likely to use some uh, uh, some Linux-based systems, uh, you know, so this is not real uncommon. So in academic research, we have it widely, right? Um, and many researchers can also contribute to open source projects such as Linux, right? Uh, or like GNU and other things, right? I've seen that uh, some papers, well, they may actually start their own projects. Uh, consider, for example, the Zen hypervisor uh, was initially, uh, I think, was OSP paper, and then uh, Zen hypervisor is became a very large open source project, and it's also used by Amazon Cloud, right? So that's another example where people are kind of using or contributing to open source projects. Um, yeah, so, and then uh, also researchers contribute to open source projects in addition to companies, right? So other examples. So I mentioned BSD previously, right? So, and BSD is another example of an operating system. And just, uh, I mean, it's probably less common than Linux nowadays, uh, though originally uh, was kind of, you know, kind of an alternative to Linux, but it's still very actively developed. You shouldn't dismiss it. It's very actively developed and there are free, uh, major, uh, you know, BSD uh, systems like FreeBSD, OpenBSD, and NetBSD. Uh, so they have, I mean, it's not actually like Linux in dis different distributions. It's actually different operating systems, but they also share some coding uh, uh, across different projects. So in one example, NetBSD was used by NASA uh, Space Acceleration Measurement System, right, to measure microgravity environment in the, uh, of the, you know, the International Space Station. And they also explored the use of TCP in the satellite networks. So that's one example when people can use it for scientific purposes also. So other more recent examples, like uh, uh, probably you have heard about this Ingenuity helicopter used on Mars, that's in the Perseverance Mars mission, right? So they uh, that, that helicopter runs on Linux. Uh, so that's another example, right? So those things that really affect our lives, right? So and, uh, I think that's uh, really, is, so like really uh, amazing how one project affected so many things, right? And maybe a related project also affected so many things. So other examples, uh, we have like a lot of embedded systems, right? So nowadays, smart fridges, smart TVs, uh, you know, so self-driving cars, uh, they run Linux. I mean, some smart TVs run also Android, but there's some some run Linux. So it's also very common. And Android itself is using Linux kernel, by the way. So that's pretty much related things, right? So, yeah. So, yeah. So that's really a lot of uh, examples. You probably can come up with many more. So I just mentioned a few. So, but how does an OS course help? Okay, we have this uh, Linux stuff. Why, why do we need to study OS, right? Uh, well, you can look at the history, right? So how, like, for example, Linux uh, came to be, right? So Linus Torvalds uh, was inspired by Professor Tannenbaum Minix textbook. And Professor Tannenbaum uh, was just teaching, teaching an operating system course, just like I'm doing right now, right? And they would develop, uh, you know, mini operating system, and they had some course projects. Uh, and uh, he published this textbook. Uh, and even though Linus Storch was not his, uh, you know, student, direct student, he was like indirect student because he read his textbook uh, and implemented Linux. And initially, Linux was, uh, you know, following the Minix style. So that's uh, that's how the one uh, kind of one professor on OS course has probably changed uh, uh, like Linus life and Linus will, uh, changed other things, right? So this is how things can uh, uh, can happen, right? So this is why an OS course is important. Um, you know, again, you know, maybe most of you will not be uh, uh, will not be 
developing an operating system eventually, right? But you still, uh, I, I mean, maybe some of you will, but uh, you know, but most of you probably will not be developing an operating system. But you know, some of you will be working in related fields, like you will be working on databases, maybe it's web servers, you know, other things that require to know how operating system works. Um, also, even if you don't work in that field, like you work in completely different field, like machine learning, right? Still important to know how operating system works so that you write your stuff uh, uh, efficiently. So you still need to be able to write your programs efficiently, uh, whether they're using CPUs or GPUs, whatever they're using, right? So all this knowledge is very important. So also just one quote, uh, uh, like from the CS app textbook that I mentioned for, for the memory allocator. So one of these authors, Randall Bryant was teaching like, uh, you know, graduate and undergraduate courses like for 30 years, right? And uh, he was, you know, teaching computer architecture courses and he, you know, so also realized that kind of we have to change the way that we teach computer systems that it's very really, very important to exp uh, to explain to uh, uh, to to future programmers how that works, right? Because programs will be able to write, uh, you know, more efficient and reliable programs if they understand the systems better. So if you know how the OS works internally, you can write programs better, right? So that's what what's important. Um, and doesn't matter what field you are working uh, in, right? So I, I think. You can make this case for almost any field. Okay, so also security, right? From the security standpoint. So in the past, we didn't care about security too much, I guess. People cared about security, but not to the same extent. I think last lecture I mentioned get as uh, one example, right? As a potential bug, a buffer flow attack. So this is an example when a really bad function uh, got standardized, right? So it was in the original C standard and this function is never safe uh, under any circumstances. You shouldn't just, it shouldn't, you shouldn't just use it at all. It's deprecated nowadays. So if you try to compile a program and use get as uh, GCC will tell you that this function is deprecated. You shouldn't be using it. So because even if it's just a simple hello world program, you can still have a buffer flow when you use this uh, function. Um, so it's uh, you have to have a more safe version which checks the how many characters uh, you enter. So it's I think get s underscore s version or something like that. Uh, so they have changed that. So in other words, people didn't care too much about this. We got a lot of buggy programs, a lot of security vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, a lot of, uh, like if you like write sloppy code, like without checking bounds, you know, this is really easy to have security vulnerabilities. And to, if you understand how the OS work, you also hopefully will be in, you know, how systems work and have this exposure to systems programming. Hopefully you will be writing more safer code, which will not have the security vulnerabilities. And it also matters, again, in other fields, take machine learning. There's a lot of, Things like security and machine learning concerns. Someone conjugs some models, right? So someone, well, let's say if you are driving, sell, sell driving cars, what if someone hijacks that uh, running some exploit and, you know, then your car crashes, right? So that's really bad, right? So this is something to keep in mind. So security is very important, right? So, and it becomes more and more important nowadays. <clears throat> so, what else? Uh, so it also affects hardware, right? So security affects hardware. Let's look at some examples where uh, some hardware bugs existed for 20 years or, or more than 20 years, actually. So look at the meltdown inspector bugs uh, and they required immediate like mitigation from the operating system. I think they were discovered in 2017, but they postponed the announcement till 2018 so that uh, the operating systems like common operating systems such as Windows, Linux, you know, other systems like MacOS can pro produce these mitigations. Uh, I guess that was not publicly discussed, right? Why we need this mitigation, right? Uh, so they produce these mitigations 
uh, and then uh, they announced this box, right? So they first patched the operating systems, but it affected a lot of things, right? So let's look at the meltdown bug, for example, right? So from there, like a quote from the web, their website, meltdown breaks the most fundamental isolation between user application and the operating system. This attack allows a program to access the memory and thus also the secrets of other programs and the operating system. So how is it possible? Well, in operating system, you have virtual memory, right? So, and I mentioned that previously, it's some topic that we're gonna discuss next. And each process has a, uh, is normally isolated from another process. But because of the hardware bug, because of speculative execution that happened in hardware, there was a there was a possibility that one process can access, you know, kernel memory which was not supposed to access, and consequently it could access any other process memory or any OS memory. It basically, could read anything that you have in your system. Uh, you know, you have to do some steps to do to make it work, but basically the entire process isolation was broken, right? So the, because of that. So people like were running things under the assumption like for 20 years that everything is safe, but turns out that if you do some tricks, it's not actually safe. Uh, yeah, so immediately that things had to be patched, of course, right? So there was a way around this, um, but it caused, I think, slowdowns up to 30% slowdowns. So it's pretty bad uh, when you run it, like your system was previously running 30% faster. So after you patch your operating system, you can blame your person who found this bug, right? So now your system runs slower. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, so, so the Spectre bug, uh, um, so the Spectre also uh, from, also this was announced simultaneously with Meltdown. Uh, so that also breaks, that bro breaks isolation between different applications. So it allows an attacker to trick error-free programs which follow best practices into leaking their secrets. So imagine that. In fact, the safety checks of said best practices actually increase the attack surface and may, uh, and may make application more susceptible to Spectre. So that means if you are doing some additional checks to make sure that everything is safe, like you check and bounce, that can actually make things even worse, uh, right? So for, for Spectre. So imagine you were a good programmer, did a good job, but still because of this hardware bug, uh, your stuff is broken. Um, so that's another example, right? So that unfortunately didn't have, a, I mean, that's uh, that doesn't have a slow, significant slowdown, but the problem is that you cannot use indirect branches easily anymore right? when you have Spectre, brand, uh, Spectre bug, you have to make sure that there is no speculative execution by the processor. And uh, that required, I think, recompilation of the kernel and some programs uh, that has to be made Spectre um, bug aware, right? For Meltdown, you could at least avoid, there was a slowdown, but you could at least avoid recompilation of the regular application. I mean, you still have to patch the kernel, but not the regular applications. Yeah, so that's something to keep in mind. So these bugs were really big deal. So also just, just to kind of quote uh, from Wikipedia, right? So Meltdown, look at this, it was one of the two original transient execution that uh, came in together with Spectre, right? Meltdown affects Intel x86, IBM power, some are based, uh, you know, basically all common architectures that we had, right? So in 2018, not just one, uh, not just x86. Yeah, so many service cloud uh, services were impacted, you know, smart devices, embedded devices, even your printer was basically <laughs> potentially impacted, right? I guess you can patch your computer easily, maybe even smart TV, and I'm not sure about the printer, right? If it can be easily patched, right? So probably there are still some devices which are vulnerable to these attacks, right? And especially because even though the bug was fixed, well, was announced in 2018, 2018 it was not fixed right away, right? It was fixed after this, like, I mean, uh, I think the bug free CPUs appeared only later. Uh, so you still have to run these mitigations. 
So in the workaround required to slow down things uh, because you had to implement system calls in a special way. It would potentially, if you have a lot of system calls, that would slow down things a uh, big deal. So they estimated like five to 30% in some workloads. So just to kind of joke, right? Programming is 90% debugging your code and 10% writing uh, bugs in your code. <laughs> <laughs> that probably you will learn in project one. <laughs> yeah, so it's just a joke, right? Uh, yeah, so um, so sometimes bugs can be really, really light threatening. Let's just take a look at two examples. So for example, is a concurrency bug, which is again related to the operating system. So when you have uh, uh, error due at unexpected order of execution, so there's a Terac 25 machine, right? And uh, because of the race condition, there was X-ray overdose, right? I mean, the patients, and that eventually caused death, right? So that's one example, right? So this is when we have some OS-related bugs, like some, something that we learn in operating systems, and, uh, you know, not... Uh, properly writing the code caused these issues, right? So another thing is that, like a nice example of concurrency bug is North uh, East Blackout of 2003. There was like, again, well, that region was didn't lost power and there was, again, race condition because of race condition. And again, it, people uh, stayed without power, right? And then it also caused some deaths, right? So that's really bad. So when you... Uh, uh, when you take OS course be, um, just go, you know, in the future, probably you will be working in some field. So make sure you write uh, bug free code. 